great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Um, statistics has become more and more a beautiful subject in the last uh, 10, 20 years. I think Professor Roberts is, uh, is, is one of the examples. Uh, in, um, and uh, especially, I mean, we're just discussing how MCMC revolution is a subject. And, and it's a beautiful subject uh, by any, any measure. Um, so, um, uh, Professor Roberts is visiting us from uh, Warwick uh, University, where he's a statistics and director of, a, of a, it's the Center for, well, it's, it's a Statistical Modeling Center, uh, CRISM. CRISM, yeah. The Center for Research and Statistical Modeling. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about uh, some uh, new methods for simulation, uh, retrospective simulation. So it's, uh, it's lovely to be here. This may not be the uh, nicest of days for you, but it's a lot nicer than what I've come from. So, so. Um, I, I think I left my slide up. About, I'm advertising currently a few postdoc positions. If anybody's interested, then I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it afterwards or, or where, whenever. Um, so topic of my talk uh, today is retrospective simulation. And I've given various talks on this kind of theme over recent years. Um, it's largely worked with those two people, uh, but it's quite general, and I will give some quite sort of uh, simple and then increasingly complicated examples of its use. Um, it's a topic that uh, is really very close to my heart. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, an, it's something which is a very simple uh, idea, uh, and in many ways, as I will explain quite shortly, it's sort of the oldest uh, research um, a uh, uh, topic that I think I've ever been working on, because I think the, the roots of this research actually go to my childhood. Um, okay, so that's roughly what I'll try and do. I don't normally in this talk get into too much of a detail of number three there, and I'd much rather spend more time on number one to give you a kind of sense of retrospective sampling, which is also retrospective simulation, which is, uh, as I said, a very simple idea, but uh, can get really quite intricate quite quickly. Um, so, so what is what is it? It's essentially, I mean, it's an incredibly simple idea. The idea is is that um, you've got a simulation algorithm. I mean, I'm typically interested in simulation problems which are high dimensional and sometimes infinite dimensional, and I'm interested in finding ways of doing simulation, often, if if at all possible, without any kind of um, discretization or any kind of approximation, especially if that kind of approximation or discretization is something that we don't really have a very good analytic control over, over how big the uh, error might be. Um, but the, the, the simple idea in retrospective simulation is to take uh, many algorithms that we use in, in, in uh, simulation, sometimes MCMC algorithms, sometimes simple rejection sampling algorithms or important sampling algorithms or sequential important sampling algorithms, and find ways of, of uh, doing interesting kind of reordering of steps within those algorithms um, in order to actually produce a much uh, more efficient implementation. So it sounds like a very simple idea. And really what this talk is all about is, is how you can actually apply that, first of all, in rather simple, but then actually more complicated examples. Um, it turns out to have very interesting connections with lots of things in simulation. Um, Perfect simulation coupling from the past is, can be seen as, as a special case of, of retrospective simulation. And uh, non-centering, which is a sort of methodology that's used in statistical modeling, which sort of people might actually uh, know something about. Um, I won't say anything explicitly about these two things in the talk, but if you, if you are interested in that, I will be happy to talk about them afterwards. OK, so uh, why is this? So this is the. This is the slide that I always uh, um, tailor to the, um, to the location I give the talk. And since this is the first time I've given a, a, a talk in, in Florida, I thought I'd have to say something about alligators. So, so th this is, I, was, I was brought up in England in the 1970s, largely, in 19, late 19, 1960s and 1970s. And at the time, it was, I think, the beginning of interactive television. Um, a very slow interactive tele television in the sense that um, what typically happened was there were television programs on a Saturday morning when I was allowed to watch television. Um, and they used to have these quizzes, and the quizzes were quite easy to, to try and encourage people to enter. And you would enter by basically putting your answer to the simple question on a postcard and post it into the BBC. And in those days, the post was efficient. I actually would make sure it would, get, it would definitely get there within a week. It's not true anymore. Um, and... Um, and then basically at the end of the week, the uh, BBC would, 
would find all of these postcards, they would e look at each one of them, and they would see which children had actually got the question correct, and there'd be a vast number of these because it was incredibly popular, um, and they would take all the winning postcards and put them in a big bucket and, and, and then get a celebrity of a time. Um, I don't know if you know any celebrities of, in England at that, that time, but the um, footballer or something, um, to come onto the show the following week and to draw out a winning card. Okay? Um, so this, is the, this, would, this might be the version, I'm sure it happened also in, in the US, so this might be the version on, on, on Florida television. Um, so the question might be, are alligators vegetarian? And, and the, the, the questions are structured um, in, a, in a particular way. There was always one fairly ridiculous answer, only at the weekend. Um, and the other two, maybe, uh, maybe you know, uh, it was uh, fairly easy to guess, or, or maybe some people might get it wrong. So, um, so there's one sort of sort of plausible answer, uh, one, um, one obviously correct answer, and one completely ridiculous answer. So even if you knew nothing, and you just use common sense, you'd have at least a probability half of getting this question right. Um, now, I, actually, I've been, I've been fascinated by this question since I had a conversation with Sean about it in, in December, in which he told me that allig alligators actually here in Florida are actually a vegetarian. But I wasn't quite sure that was right. And I looked it up, and I don't think that's true. But may, maybe on this campus they're vegetarian. But... OK, OK. So, um, so uh, anyway, so we will doesn't really matter what the, what the result. Um, but I do remember when I was a sort of 10-year-old child th going through the, the following thought process, well, maybe not quite in this way, that it was incredibly inefficient for the BBC to do what they did. They, spent, they had a huge army of people who went through all these postcards finding out uh, which children actually got the question right. And uh, so if you've got, obviously, if you have N people entering this competition, then there's going to be a computational cost there, which is order N. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, that's gonna, that could be very, very expensive. I mean, they, these were hugely popular. There, there wasn't much for children to do in those days. The DS hadn't been invented. And, you know, uh, also, so, so we all used to watch television on, on Saturday mornings. Um, so, OK, so, that's, so of course, that, so that would be a, one thing you could do. So this is the algorithm that, that the BBC used. At least this is what they told us that they used. So they mark each of the N entries, place the correct postcards into a bucket, shake the bucket and then, and then pick out a winner, um, and the cost of the procedure would be order n. OK. Um, OK, so, but, but a, a, a much simpler um, algorithm, uh, m much more efficient, would be to essentially forget about marking them all and just throw all the postcards into a bucket and then draw out the postcard until a winner is found. OK, so... Um, the trouble with this, of course, is, is that if you draw a postcard and you say, and the winner this week is um, Sean Mine, um, uh, oh dear, uh, he's got it wrong. And so he would then be um, laughed at by all his friends and it would just not work. So it's not very good for live television um, algorithm too. However, it is massively more efficient and obviously the computational cost is not dependent on any in any way. So this is, this is perhaps as the simplest possible example of retrospective simulation. Um, essentially, what I'm doing is a version of reordering these steps. Uh, the only difference is, is that actually the number of steps that we have to do in two is now random. But it's, it's random in a, in a way that we can very easily understand. OK, so that's retrospective simulation in a very simple context. Let's think about it now in a slightly more abstract way in terms of the kind of algorithms that we use in statistics and other simulation contexts. Um, Retrospe uh, a re rejection sampling, of course, very well known. F is a density of interest that we wish to sample from. Um, but actually, G is much easier to sample from, so we simulate from G instead. And suppose we uh, have a bound for F over G, and we simulate from G, X from G, and then we compute some acceptance probability P. Um, I simulate a uniform random variable to decide whether to accept or not, and I accept with this probability P. Otherwise, I return to one. Okay. So this is rejection simulation. Um, it's uh, sort of um, perhaps one of the first examples that you would try in a simulation course and maybe even an undergraduate course. Um, and it's very simple to understand. It's very simple to prove that it actually works. And the simple observation I'm going to make here is, is that the blue steps often are unnecessary. Um, 
I'm interested in high dimensional simulation. Actually, just handling and controlling objects in high dimensions uh, is, is going to be massively expensive. Um, so um, maybe we don't need to simulate all of X. Maybe I can get away with simulating less than that. I'd like to be lazy. Um, second problem is, is that actually to compute exactly what this thing is, which is essentially a random and a derivative, is something that's um, something that I don't necessarily need to do. Because all I need to do actually is really simulate from an event of this probability. And it's well known in, in, in lots of contexts now, becoming increasingly clear that often simulation of, from distributions is, is, is often a lot easier than evaluating the densities. You know, so, so this is the undergraduate way of learning what probability densities are and thinking that this is a sensible way to think about distributions. Well, it is mathematically, but in terms of, in terms of actually dealing with these things as random variables, very often it's, a, it's more of a hindrance. So can we get by without doing these two steps? Well, not completely, obviously. But maybe we can find some way of, of having some shortcuts to um, reduce the amount of computation we need to do in one and two. OK, so this, this is retrospective rejection sampling. It's, it's uh, s sort of slightly abstract in this context, but we will see a, an example of it later. So what it does, it turns it on its head. The randomness, the extra randomness that you always need to do rejection sampling, I'm going to do that first. That's not something that I need anything else for. I can just simulate a, a, a uniform random variable. I'm going to call it V here because actually I might do slightly different things with it than the, uh, than the random um, U I, I took in the last slide. Um, now what I'm going to do, given that V, or, or well, uh, I'm going to identify some function of x, which we just call it h, v, and x, which might live on a much simpler space than x itself. Okay, so it may be some much simpler representation of it. In situations that I'm interested in, it might be some finite dimensional approximation, in some sense, of what the full x sample path is. Or just a subset of the information contained in x, but a random subset which depends on this particular V. And I'm also going to identify, given this V, a set A. And I'm just going to do it in such a way that when I mar marginalize over V, I get this probability P of X. Okay. So the point is now all I'm going to have to do is simulate this random variable, which, as I said, may, look, may live on a much simpler probability space than the x random variable, and then just check this condition instead of the previous condition. And trivially, it's doing the same thing as rejection sampling. The only thing is, well, when we get to the end of step four and we've accepted something, we don't have all of x. We only have the bits of x which are encoded inside h, x, v. Okay, and typically, this won't be one-to-one -one because it's going to be much simpler, much smaller dimensional. So we need to have this extra step here which says, well, if I'm interested in this more complicated object x, I need to have some way of filling in the missing bits of x from the conditional distribution of x given this. Okay, so in many situations, this turns out to be simple. And in some senses, what you can then do is you can pick out exactly the bits of x that you want without having to actually look at some approximation of the entire x. OK, and, and so this is the motivation, motivational example that, that really kind of got me interested in this as a general idea, um, exact simulation of diffusions. And this is something which, um, well, sort of one of the main examples in this, in this talk will be on, on that uh, topic. Um, but before I go on to that example, I want to just give us a few other examples. Some of them are actually a little bit simpler than, than the rejection sampling one in some ways. Okay, um, so th a lot of these ideas are really rather old. Um, and this one goes back at least to De Vroy, probably a lot earlier than that, to be honest. And um, it turns out to be quite a common situation uh, that you're interested in simulating from an event of probability P where P is given by an alternating sequence where you have terms which are decreasing. Okay. You can generalize this, actually, as it happens. But suppose we've just got this simple setting. OK, so we'd like to simulate an event of probability P. 
So what you could do is you could take some truncation of that sequence, calculate it, calculate P, and then just compute a random variable on that basis. But obviously that's going to be an approximation, and um, clearly to do it exactly that way, we'd need to actually compute the entire infinite sum, which, which is normally not going to be analytically tractable. But of course, in this, in this situation, there are natural upper and lower bounds here. If I truncate the sequence after, after a positive term, I'm going to get an upper bound. And if I truncate it after a negative term, I'm going to get a lower bound for this infinite sum. OK. Moreover, these two approximations, pi plus and pi minus, are going to converge to the p value of interest. OK. So what I can do is I can try and do my simulation on the basis of these approximations. OK. So we know how to simulate a, um, an event of probability p if we know what p is. We, all we do is we simulate a uniform random variable. And if that uniform random variable is less than p, then we say that the event is true. If, that, if a uniform random variable is bigger than p, then we say the event is false. So what we do here is we do the same game, except without, instead of with p, we, we actually say, let's do it with um, the p minus and the p plus. We know that p is somewhere in between these two. So rather than actually simulate this uniform random variable after we know what p is, I'm going to first of all simulate the uniform random variable and then find out how precise I need to do in my specification of p in terms of my analytic upper and lower bounds, find out how much work I need to do in order to find out whether p is less than u or bigger than u. So all I do is I'll, I'll basically find an i such that both pi plus and pi minus are either both above or below u. And when the values of u are less than u, the event is true. Otherwise, the event is false. And this is actually quite an efficient thing to do, especially if, if this is a, 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 a sequence which is converging at, say, a geometric rate. Um, obviously, there's a stochastic running, running time here. Um, but, uh, but essentially, it's efficient because I only need to compute as many terms in this series as I need to actually ascertain whether this event that u is less than p is actually true or false. OK, so that's something that's a nice method. I just want to give an example of that, which uh, can we've used a little bit. So this is a well-known um, property of Brownian motion hitting times. So if you've got uh, the first, if you're interested in the first hitting time, Brownian motion to a constant boundary, then it's uh, analytically tractable. It has a CDF that you can actually write down explicitly in terms of a cumulative normal, just by the rejection of the uh, reflection principle. OK, so this is all very nice. But as soon as you start talking about two-sided hitting um, probabilities or hitting times for Brownian motion, you have something that's uh, rather more complicated. And it turns out. Again, by the reflection principle, there's a nice argument that says that you have su such a representation for the probability in terms of an um, uh, one of these alternating decreasing sequences. So in other words, what you can do is you can, you can apply the de Broglie's method in order to simulate from this and really do it rather efficiently because it turns out that these terms here are converging really rather, qui rather quickly to zero. Okay, so, that's, that's, so that's an example of how you can do that. So there's no approximation. So the only approximations intrinsic in this method are approximations due to the fact that, obviously, within any computer, we have finite precision. So there's no mathematical approximations at all in terms of what we're doing. OK, let's look at a, a slightly different. And this is, uh, this is an example which... Um, um, comes up an awful lot, actually, in, in Bayesian statistical applications um, and um, for discrete distributions. And there's an example later, which I'll probably at least briefly mention. We've got a collection of probabilities, P1, P2, P3. Sorry, uh, they're not probabilities, they're numbers, they're positive numbers. Um, and they're bounded above by numbers QI, OK? And uh, what do you know? Well, you know that this, you, you, have, you have analytic um, control over 
the sum from any value up to infinity of the Q's, so you can actually calculate this thing here. And, um, we, but what actually you want to do is you want to simulate from the P's. What you want to do is you want to simulate from a disc the discrete distribution which has probabilities which are proportional to the P's, but you don't know what the normalization constant for the P's is. So this is just a sort of classic uh, situation that you get in lots of situations, um, particularly when you're doing Bayesian statistics. When, you, when, you, when, you're, using Bayesian, when you're doing Bayesian statistics, um, typically the QI here might be proportional to the, um, uh, the prior distribution. Okay? So it might be something like the prior distribution times the maximum possible value of the likelihood, for instance. And the PI is going to be the posterior distribution, which typically you don't know the normalization constant for. So this is quite a common situation to actually have. Um, what we'd like to do, though, is to simulate from the P's and um, to do it as efficiently as we can. But we'd, what we'd like to do is to avoid the need for any approximations here. So um, this is what we would do if we were using the inverse CDF method. We'd calculate this infinite sum. Um, we'd simulate a uniform random variable, and we'd just set x to be the smallest j such that this normalized probabilities here is bigger than or equal to u. Okay, so this is something, in principle, you could do if you could actually do the blue step here, calculating the s. So how can you do this by retrospective simulation? What we want to do is we want to avoid calculating this infinite sum uh, but because of the properties that we actually have up here, there are natural candidates for upper and lower bounds for the S. Um, the upper bounds are going to come from the fact that we know, an upper, uh, we know the properties of the, the uh, tail probabilities of the Qs, of a tail sum of the Qs. And the lower bounds are just going to come from a partial sum where we truncate. Okay, so we're going to have a way. So similar to the previous example, there are natural ways of getting better and better analytical exact upper and lower bounds uh, for this value s. So all I'm going to really do here is I'm going to say, right, I'm not going to calculate this. I'm going to do this step first. And given this step first, okay, I'm going to con compute some kind of approximations for s, upper and lower bounds for these. And then I'm going to try and produce an x based on these upper and lower bounds. And if the two x's I get for the upper and lower bounds give me the same answer, then I can stop. If it does not give me the same answer, I then need to find better analytic upper and lower bounds for s. Okay, so that's basically what this scary stuff is doing. Um, first of all, you've got lower bounds, which are just given by the uh, partial sum up to j. Of the, uh, of the for this s, so that's a lower bound for s. You've got an upper bound which is given by the sum of the partial sum plus the uh, the um, uh, the, the uh, infinite sum of the, the the q's, the upper bounds, and then we have this nice telescoping property here that the lower bounds and the upper bounds uh, are are monoton monoton monotonically converging, um, respectively, to s from below and above. Okay. And we can actually write down the um, cumulative distribution function okay, of um, using an approximation. So this is, a, this is a, an upper approximation to the cumulative distribution function of the random variable x, which uses the lower bound to the s's. Because right? the yeah, one over s is on the bottom, so that is going to give me an upper bound to the distribution function. And this is going to give me a, a lower bound to the distribution function. Okay, so these bounds here will turn into bounds on this distribution function with everything flipped because of the 1 over s. And what I do then is I say, well, for this particular j, this particular level of approximation, I'm going to find a, a random variable x plus j and a random variable x minus j. These may well be different, and if they're different, that means that we don't have an accurate enough approximation for s. But if they're the same, then I know that actually, even if I did this with the true s, I would get the same value. Okay, so I know that x lies in between these two values here. So 
simplest to see using a picture here. This is an example where it has actually converged. So this is the, 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 uh, this is the um, algorithm. I start off by simulating a uniform random variable, compute the uh, x minus random variable and the x plus ran random variable. Here's the uh, lower bound on the CDF. Here's the upper bound on the CDF. So these things are going to go some to plus, some bigger than one, and some to things which are less than one. And suppose a uniform random variable lies here, when it lies between the first and the second in the plus variable, and also lies between the first and second in the minus variable. So the plus random variable and the minus random variable uh, at the jth level both equal x, and in this case both take the value 2. Okay. So um, it works in this case here as well. So this is something that um, it turns out that you can use in a Dirichlet mixture model example. I'm saying that now just in case I don't have a chance to say it later. Um, okay, so, so I'm not going to say anything at all about this example. There's lots of stuff on this. Um, but there's lots of opportunities of using this in, in MCMC. And, and I'm interested in a lot of MCMC um, problems in which you have a, a variable which has an infinite state space. Um, and um, infinite dimensional state space. And then you've got other variables which perhaps live on maybe Euclidean, Euclidean space. So in, you can think of it in some sense as you've got theta simple. It may still be fairly high dimensional. And you've got x, which is complex, typically something like the trajectory of a stochastic process. And you might be interested in doing something like alternating between updating theta and updating in x in a Markov ch chain Monte Carlo scheme. OK. So this step here, simulating x given theta, may well be the most complicated step here, because this is the step which involves maybe infinite dimensional simulation. But what you could do is you could say, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to be lazy. I'm not going to do all of this. I'm not going to simulate x given theta. I will just simulate a little bit of it. And then what I will do is I'll do the next step for theta. And then I will look at the theta that I get here. And if I actually have enough of the x from the previous simulation step, then that's fine. If I don't, then I'll go back a bit and then just do a little bit more simulation for x. So this is really lazy simulation. What I'm saying is I'll just, I'll essentially, I won't bother finishing this task until I actually know how much I need from that task in order to do, actually do the future iterations. So this is exactly the sort of motivation behind this work that I did quite a long time ago now with uh, Laird Breyer. And there's actually more recent stuff as well, also, with, with, with lead. So there's lots of kind of fun things you can try and do for this. Um, it turns out you can look at coupling from the past and other um, perfect simulation techniques in, in a sort of fairly kind of similar way. Um, um, but now I want to go on to um, look at an example, which is... Uh, um, something which uh, we were sort of amazed when, when it, it, it turned out to be a, a really rather simple problem. Um, and we've done quite a lot of work on this since, but I like talking about the simple um, kind of first simulation step um, because, uh, well, I just like it really. Um, so uh, what I'm interested in is I'm interested in stochastic uh, uh, simulation of, of diffusion. So um, I, I'm going to do everything in one dimension here. You can generalize some, but not all of this, to multi-dimensions. And in fact, the complexity of doing that is not so bad at all. Uh, um, but I'm interested in simulating from an SDE that looks like this. Um, most of you probably know a little bit about SDEs, but I mean, we can think of it in terms of for small epsilon, the limit is epsilon goes to zero of this kind of discrete dynamical uh, stochastic system. And this is sometimes called the uh, euler mariama approximation to the SDE. Um, and it can be used for all finite small epsilon. So if you want to, so a good way of thinking constructively mathematically about diffusions is to think of it in terms of this equation here. And in fact, um, of course, that's also a natural way to actually simulate from the diffusion. And, and there's a whole collection of, of, of more clever, more sophisticated discretization methods that you might use an alternative to this. However, they all have the same property that they're all going to be approximate. 
but apart from in some really, really very, very specialized situations, um, if epsilon is bigger than zero, this will be an approximation. Moreover, the computational cost of this um, is actually going to get greater and greater for, for larger epsilon. So it would be quite nice to have methods which could somehow um, not have to live in the world where um, we had to rely on sort of discretizations. This is a naturally something that lives in uh, trajectories in continuous time. Okay, so of course this is what, so this thing really is, is uh, um, so, so my aims for this work are I want, I want to sort of have some way of, of simulating the whole sample path. And when I say that, I, I mean, I, first of all, I want to be able to do something which is without approximation. But also, I want to have some way of representing within my computer that entire trajectory. Okay, I, wa I want to somehow find some way of, of representing this infinite dimensional object in some kind of finite way within my computer. So in some sense, I want to have some way of representing the diffusion sample path um, to have some kind of d uh, DNA, if you like, some kind of um, something from which I could build everything. Obviously, I can't just write down every, every value ev on this continuum uh, of the diffusion at all time points. I can't do that, but I need to have some way of looking that up at any particular time if I want to. So in some sense, what I'm asking for here is something a little bit more than just a way of representing, um, of, of doing some minimal simulation problem. Um, so why we do, well, we do this for lots of reasons. I'm not going to talk about any of them today, so um, really. Um, but just, just pure Monte Carlo estimation for diffusions, useful in lots of areas, um, finance, economics, not least in lots of other areas as well. Um, um, I've used these a lot in sort of inference problems for um, partially observed um, diffusions and, and related models like jump diffusions. Um, and we've also done work on exact particle filtering um, um, well, in a sense which I'm not going to define because it's not exact in, unless you define it carefully. Um, so so th this, is, this is why. So there's lots of reasons why th this is a sort of interesting thing to do. And, and it, so the imputation schemes for Bayesian inference is the motivation behind getting some representation for the entire sample path because I want to work with that and, and actually have MCMC schemes which do not rely on the discretization which is intrinsic to actually um, most approximation schemes for diffusions. Okay, okay so now just a little bit of a of uh, theory, you don't need to know too much about this, but uh, diffusion density. So if you have a diffusion, um, then it um, has some very nice properties. So if you look at this diffusion here, which is the same thing except with no drift, um, then under pretty weak regularity conditions, then um, there's a Radonikin and derivative uh, between the law of interest and this law here, which is the, well, the driftless diffusion given by the camera martin gersenol formula, or just Gersenol formula for short. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is nice because it's something that's uh, analytically, you can write it down as, as, a, as an integral. Uh, of course, you can't do these integrals, and this is a, this is a path integral, and this is a stochastic integral here. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a deterministic integral, but of a stochastic object here. So you can write this thing down, but you can't actually calculate it. Okay, so, um, so the reason why it's interesting for us is that it's a random Nikonian derivative. And if you look at rejection sampling, rejection sampling is essentially where you control everything by looking at f over g. It's just a random Nikonian derivative. So in a complicated space, if you want to do rejection sampling, then you might be looking for a representation like this. You might be interested in simulating from something like this, and then you might be looking to do some kind of rejection sampling. But there's all sorts of problems to actually applying that idea. Um, let me just say, uh, I'm just going to go, yeah, just I want to say something before I go on. Um, very shortly, I'm going to restrict attention to the case where sigma equals one. Okay, sigma equals one. Um, and what, that has the effect that um, 
this now becomes something that I can recognize. It's just Brownian motion. Brownian motion is something we can simulate from, um, and that's obviously going to be very helpful. Now, in one dimension, um, you can pretty much always uh, reduce to the case of sigma equal to 1 via a simple transformation. You can't always do that in high dimensions. But in one dimension, you can sort of always do that. So you can reduce this, problem, this simulation problem to the problem of sigma equals 1. OK, so this is my sort of wish list. Since that's a Radonikian derivative, that's got us thinking about what might be a sensible algorithm. So let's, let's uh, this is our first try. This is not going to work, but let's try. So I want to do rejection sampling. I'll find some k, which is an upper bound, which is an almost sure upper bound to uh, that Gersonov formula on the previous slide. OK. Um, so I've already gone to the case of sigma being constant, so that that p naught measure, the proposal measure, is just Brownian motion. So the second thing I'll do is I'll sample a Brownian motion, an entire Brownian motion sample path. I'll compute the Gersonov change of measure evaluated at that particular sample, proposed sample value. Um, I'll find some indicator variable i, which takes the value 1 with this probability gb over k. And then I'll, if that succeeds, then I'll output b. Otherwise, I'll um, go back. So this outputted value actually has the required distribution. And that's, that's clearly true from um, simple re um, rejection sampling. Because rejection sampling, there's no, in the proof of rejection sampling, you could have any space in there, any measure space. OK, so why does this not work? Well, let's think. So um, there are a number of reasons why it doesn't work. Um, one is, is that um, step two here, sample a whole Brownian motion sample path. That's not something that we can do. Um, step three involves us having to compute numerically um, this infinite integral. Well, um, you could compute it approximately, but you're not going to be able to compute it exactly unless there's some nice accidents in being able to compute these things. And, th and the other problem, actually, is a more fundamental one, that finding a constant capital K such that the Gersonov formula for any trajectory, any potential trajectory of our proposed distribution is always bounded up by a constant K, that's something that typically I won't be able to do. So um, that sounds like um, we can't do the first three steps, but everything else is fine, which doesn't say much. OK, so, so this problem is GB is typically unbounded. Step two is impossible, and step three is also impossible for those reasons. OK. So retrospective simulation comes here and says, well, well, maybe we can do step four without computing GB explicitly. So maybe we can circumvent the need to actually do um, step two. Uh, is that th uh, three? Yeah, that's step three, yeah. Um, but there's a more fundamental worry. And the more fundamental worry is, is that if we don't have a, an upper bound for the Radonikian derivative, then actually this is not going to be a mathematically valid way of doing it, even if it was a, an approximation. OK. So now we just need to sort of simplify the problem a little bit. Um, I've, uh, yeah, so this is the diffusion here, reduced to unit diffusion coefficient. Um, and we changed the name of the drift here just to sort of show that we're talking about it in the transformed scale. So we call the drift here alpha. Um, and I'm just going to rewrite my Gersonov change of measure. And it turns out that I can rewrite it um, in one dimension at least um, in this following way, which is, uh, turns out to be the natural way of writing it. I can write it as um, a, a of x1 minus a of x0, where a is a function just given by, oh, I don't say what it is there. Uh, so a is the function which is the, just the um, uh, indeterminate integral of, of the function alpha. So a is just the integral of alpha. Um, so log g is a of the terminal point of a trajectory minus the starting point of a trajectory, minus, and then I've just written the rest of it in terms of a constant here, l and uh, an r multiplied by a deterministic integral. OK, and what is that phi? That phi just turns out to be something 
which has this expression here. So it's just, it's just a function that you can write down explicitly in terms of alpha. So what are these L and these R? Well, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to make a, at least initially, I'm going to make a strong assumption, a very strong assumption. Um, I'm going to assume that alpha prime plus alpha squared over 2 has a lower bound. That's not such a strong assumption. There's a square in here which normally dominates what's going on. So having a lower bound for this is not unreasonable. Having an upper bound is a stronger condition. But um, it's still something that's satisfied by quite a few interesting diffusions. So now, so that, so the R can be interpreted as the range of this uh, critical function here. And what this function is doing, and the, re the fluctuations in this, in this function, are sort of describing um, uh, deviations away from um, Brownian motion. OK, so that's the expression for the Gersonov change of measure. Um, and so remember, to, to apply rejection sampling, we need this thing to be bounded. Okay, so the trouble is, is that this term here now looks like it's going to be really nicely controlled. Okay, it's an integral between 0 and 1, deterministic integral of phi, which is a function which is now going to be contained between 0 and 1. Okay, so this bit's not going to be a problem. This bit, though, is. So what do you do in rejection sampling when you don't have an upper bound for the radon nuclear derivative? You have to find a different proposal a different proposal to simulate from. And preferably, since x naught is a starting value, this is the term that's a problem, preferably this will be some, some um, proposal distribution which somehow tries to cancel with this A. And that's exactly what you do. So I can, so you introduce something called the biased Brownian motion candidate. Um, and what's bias Brownian motion? It's Brownian motion which has the property that at time 1, instead of having a normal 0, 1 distribution, it has a normal distri 0, 1 distribution here, but perturbed by an exponential expression e to the capital A of x. Okay, so this is just the distribution at time 1. Now, I said Brown bias Brownian motion was an entire, um, well, this is just an entire process on the, on the time interval 0, 1. So um, how do I, so that tells me what the law of bias Brownian motion at time 1 is. What about the distribution at all other times? Well, actually, at all other times, it's just going to be a Brownian bridge. So in, in all other ways, it will behave as if it was exactly a Brownian motion. So the way to think of bias Brownian motion is not to think about it completely sequentially moving forward in time, but we think about it in terms of constructing time at the end point and then filling in the gaps by a Brownian bridge. So we do, if we do this, then um, that's something, well, it's mathematically precise as a definition, but moreover, we can actually simulate from it. This is merely a one-dimensional simulation problem for simulating the, t the value at time 1, and everything else is Brownian bridge, so that just has normal distributions. Okay, so that's something we can simulate from. And moreover, just rearranging from the previous side, if I simulate instead from this biased Brownian motion instead of just the ordinary Brownian motion, then this Radonikinin derivative between P and W tilde now has a very, very simple form. This, remember, was the range of the, this, is in, this R is, is in some sense a measure of the nonlinearity of the diffusion. And I have this expression. Okay. So now I have something that's going to be bounded. So mathematically, I can write down a rejection sampling algorithm. But can I implement it? So I need to ha have some way of simulating from an event of this probability. Okay, so how can I simulate from an event of this probability? The standard way of doing it would be to say, calculate x, calculate this integral, toss a coin, etc., or do whatever. We can't do that. Um, so instead, I'm just going to notice the fact that this is, a, um, this is the zero probability of a Poisson process. So if, if you have a Poisson process of rate r on the epigraph of phi, OK, the values of y which lie between 0 and phi, between Z, s and 1, OK, the, the probability of you getting 0 points of such, this is the Poisson process, the probability of getting 0 points is just equal to this. Okay. 
So all I need to do, so the problem now reduces to constructing, instead of just an auxiliary uniform random variable or collection of uniform random variables or coin tosses or whatever, I now need a Poisson process. And that Poisson process will allow me to determine whether this is true or not. But it's still not, we're still not there. What? Um, in fact, so, so this is what's, we're not, so this is the algorithm. Now the algorithm is, 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 is really is this short. You can, you can code this up in R in, in a small number of lines. Even I can do the coding for this algorithm, which um, amused all my PhD students when we came up with this, because I don't normally, I can't normally do the computing for some of these things. Um, so basically what you, what you do is you simulate the bias Brownian motion, but you do it in this order. So the first thing you do is you simulate the endpoint of the bias Brownian motion according to the uh, bias Brownian motion distribution. But now instead of actually computing the rest of the proposed sample path, I'm going to let the Poisson process tell me which other points I want to simulate from. Can I write on here maybe, just, just a drawn diagram? Is there a, a, oh yeah, here we are. So just, just to show, so basically the idea is the, the non-retrospective simulation, can you sort of see this? The non-retrospective simulation algorithm would simulate the whole trajectory, calculate phi of x, which is essentially this trajectory here, and then compute um, a Poisson process on the shaded region. Okay. Now phi is a function which takes values between 0 and 1. Okay, 0, 1. And we're on a time interval 0, 1 here. So clearly, the simplest way of actually simulating a Poisson process on the shaded region is to simulate a Poisson process on the unit square. And then just ask the question, well, if I have a Poisson process on the unit square, are any of the points actually below phi of x, in which case they'll be in the shaded region, or are all the points above there? So the rejection event here for the rejection sampler is just we reject whenever any of the points of the Poisson process on the unit square actually lie below the uh, phi of x. Okay, so this is exactly what this algorithm is doing. I think I've got some other data. Oh, yeah, this is better than the one I just... Yeah, so this is an example of an accepted path. Okay, so I had a, a Poisson process on the unit square... And in this case, the Poisson process gave me one, two, three, four, five values, okay? And uh, I, had, I then had to go away, I had to calculate phi of the, of the proposal value at each of these points. So the dotted trajectory there, I haven't simulated from. These are the bits I've been lazy about, but I've actually had to simulate these ones, okay? In this case, all, this, all these... The x's are above the blue dots, and therefore the trajectory is accepted. Okay. So and uh, so once I've done that, actually I won't I won't describe it in terms of that. I'll just go into this. Um, and it t it turns out that for um, this is a this is a method that is amazingly efficient. Um, it isn't something which relies on you being able to simulate just in small time intervals, whatever. It turns out that you can piece together trajectories in very, very efficient ways to actually simulate entire trajectories. And what, what, you, what do you get out of the method? The, the method actually gives you this kind of random skeleton. You evaluate from it the proposed or the accepted sa um, sample path value at all of the times where the Poisson process actually decided to, to look to, to actually check this condition. Okay, they're not Poisson points once you've done the accepting because there's a subtle dependence between the acceptance event and the, um, and the, uh, the Poisson randomness. Um, but you'd end up with something like this. But the sense in which this is the sort of DNA of, of the sample path is that you can, if now you're interested in, in points in between two of the skeletal points, all you need to remember 
is to go back to this diagram here and to say, well, actually, in principle, the mathematical algorithm has simulated the whole of the dashed path here. OK, so, and that was all simulated from Brownian motion or Brownian bridges. Right, so actually, if I want any of these points in between here, I could just go back later and then just interpolate using a normal random variable. Okay? It doesn't matter. It doesn't actually matter where that point is. There's a conditional independence between all of these points here and the accept-reject decision conditional on the blue points there. And so therefore, any complex dependence of this distribution here on the, uh, the diffusion that I'm interested in is actually completely washed out. There's no further dependence on diffusion. I can forget completely that the original drift of my diffusion was, uh, was alpha. So this is, so the skeleton acts a little bit like a random sufficient statistic for the entire sample path of the diffusion. And, uh, and, and there's this mechanism, as I said, to reconstruct its value at any of these time points. OK, so I've done this a little bit slower than I thought. So that's basically how you can use the output. You can always simulate more points. I've uh, got some simple examples. This is just a very simple example, but just um, this, this is when we sort of realized that it had some quite nice efficiency properties. That If, a, if you look at the Euler scheme here, um, then you get uh, the Euler scheme was, um, this is using uh, um, four time points. This is using eight, 16, 32. Um, the exact simulation method involves very, very few um, simulation steps. So actually, this, it, it turns out to be that the computational cost of this um, is, is really somewhere between here and here. And the, the massive bias that you get for ha having only four time points, well, not that massive in this case, but it's still consi considerable bias. Um, and yet, the exact method is actually giving you something that's completely exact. OK. There are situations in which the exact method doesn't work very efficiently. And it can work quite poorly, especially when, when you have um, extremely volatile uh, uh, drift coefficients for the diffusion. Um, so I wouldn't want to give the impression that it always beats discretization methods, but it often does. Um, so I'm going to sort of uh, have to wrap up shortly, so I, I'll, I'll be quick about this. So the method is exact, computational is simple, and, and efficient. And, and it turns out that, that, that having this representation as a skeleton means for Monte Carlo purposes, very often we can get reduced variance estimation just using the fact that we have analytical properties of the Brownian bridge. So we can use sort of rail blackwellized estimators for certain uh, uh, quantities of interest. Um, so actually, some, some type, in some sense, having less of a sample path is often better in terms of uh, efficiency of Monte Carlo methods. Um, I guess I haven't really got time to go on to, to. So we made a very strong assumption about an upper bound for alpha squared plus alpha prime over 2. Um, suffice to say that you can relax that completely. Um, and it turns out that. Uh, what you need then is you need to actually produce an, a, another Brownian motion uh, new construction, which is which we just call uh, layered Brownian motion, and there's there's various versions of this. Um, but layered Brownian motion is 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 a is a way of uh, adding in information about um, the um, a layer um, in this case between B3 and B4, or between uh, x minus A3 or x minus A4. Um, and uh, it, the, so the layer information is a discrete random variable, which essentially describes how far up or how, how far down you actually go. What's the purpose for doing this? Because in some sense, you can kind of constructively do a kind of localization um, to allow you to then to only require that, uh, that alpha squared plus alpha prime over 2 is bounded within the interval in which you know the trajectory is. So in some sense, what you're doing here is you just giving yourself enough information from the Brownian skeleton itself to then be able to sort of bound the values of phi along the trajectories. And that information is given by bounds. And that's not very easy to do because then the, the actual um, distributional properties of the skeletons that then you 
simulate from the proposed skeletons um, are, are much more complicated and, um, because then you need to condition on the, the level of the layer and various other things. So that's something which I'm not going to go into. Again, i uh, be more than happy to talk about that. We're doing a lot of work on, on extending those kind of methods um, at the moment. Um, so that's the EA3 skeleton, uh, which is the extended version of the method. Um, so, so we can extend it in various ways. Um, it, it's a very interesting question to ask about the multivariate extensions. Um, you can only partially do that. There are, uh, there are two fundamental mathematical reasons why you can't do this for all multivariate diffusions, even if you have sufficient smoothness. But you still can do them for many interesting classes of multivariate diffusions, and the computational costs are not awful in doing that. Um, these are things we've been working on. Um, um, it turns out that if you're looking at bridge simulation, diffusion bridges are typically um, um, analytically a pain to, to work with. Um, uh, they're um, not very tractable. Um, but it turns out that in this context, they're very easy. Um, Variance reduction, I think I briefly hinted about that, and then you can do various those things. And there are all sorts of interesting connections um, which allow you to calculate Malleable derivatives as well. Um, have I? I haven't got any time for this, I think. Um, I, I, I just want to say that the, the, the Dirichlet mixture example um, is something which we've been working on recently, and also we've applied it to uh, um, some quite interesting genetic data sets in which you use Dirichlet mixture um, errors um, in hidden Markov models. Um, and it turns out to be something that directly relies on, on retrospective simulation methods, uh, such as the ones I gave at the beginning. So let me just go, just zoom to the end. If anyone's interested, I can show you that later. Um, yeah, so that's the work I was just talking about, uh, which appeared last uh, 2011 now, actually, so in uh, RSSB um, using HMMs in um, gene mapping problems uh, should have been uh, quite successful. Um, so, so, so we find so this is a, in some sense the the simple retrospective simulation idea is incredibly simple, right? I mean, you, it's it's really is very basic. But actually implementing it leads to all sorts of interesting um, intricacies. But the potential benefits are huge. I mean, they're they, they're reducing an infinite computational cost often to a finite computational cost. Um, what's the downside? The downside is, for instance, in the diffusion case, you really needed to know quite a lot about the properties of Brownian motion. And uh, in fact, we had to construct some slightly new things for Brownian motion, which otherwise would not have been probabilistically interesting. And so hadn't been considered by probabilists before. You sort of need to sort of understand these things to construct a lot of these methods, because there's a lot of complex dependencies that you need to take care of. Um, there are all sorts of things on my wish list of th th which this is perhaps uh, right at the top. I'd love to be able to sort of extend all of this perfect simulation method um, to uh, SDEs which are driven by things like uh, infinite activity levy processes. But I don't suppose I'll ever do that, but it would be nice, nice to think I, I might. Okay, so that's, that's uh, it. So thank you very much.